Hello, Brother Gabe. I recently found your channel and have really been listening to your teachings and videos on repeat. I'll get right to the point. I gave my life to Christ about two years ago. Since then, after being on fire for God for a little while, after my initial conversion, water baptism and repentance, I found myself eventually backsliding into sin, returning to my vomit. Since the first time I backslid, I felt I feel like I have been stuck in a cycle of sin. Confess, repent, sin, confess, repent. I know God's judgment is nigh, and I've on honestly just been getting depressed because I haven't overcome sin. He says can't here, which just makes me sin more. I know my sin is grievous to God, and it makes me feel awful and a little hopeless after how much I've sinned against Him. What can I do? Thank you for your confession, friend. I've noticed a few red flags here in your language. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you write these things, it means that you apparently are believing them in your heart or you're wanting to believe them. One of the things that stuck out to me quickly is that you say that you're getting depressed because you haven't or can't overcome sin. Well, you want to you want to just delete this word in here, can't, cannot. You want to erase that from your vocabulary when it comes to your problem with walking in sin and the pleasures of the flesh. It's more like you haven't overcome sin. You have not overcome sin. Very quickly, let's go to James 1, and it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So James is already getting rid of the notion that God is the one who is tempting the individual. Oh, pity, pity me, pity me. Woe is me. I'm just being tempted of God. I can't overcome this. I can't. I cannot over the, uh, overcome this temptation that is coming from God. No, that's false. That's a lie. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither he tempteth any man. We're taking a look at the progression here. Verse 14. But every man is tempted when he, the man, is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So it's the man, the individual person, who's drawn away of his own lust, his own craving, his own desire, his own imaginations, his own curiosity. He's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. It's not God who's doing the tempting. It's the man's own personal desire, personal seeking of pleasure when you state that you just you just can't overcome sin that's not a good position to be in because you will never overcome these temptations with that sort of language and that sort of thought process it's your own lust and your enticements you're drawn away by your own lust and your enticements Verse 15, then when lust hath conceived, so you don't put a stop to it. The Bible says, cast down every imagination. But you have not done that. So when lust progresses and it's conceived, it brings forth sin. It says here, uh, which makes me sin more. I know, I know. My sin is grievous to God. So you have a knowledge of what you're doing that is wrong. And to him that knoweth to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So you, you're, in that, you're in a very dangerous position. You're in the, the point of, of knowledge of your sin. So you're sinning with a high hand. You have already been instructed and taught by the word of God. You've said you've Watch the teachings and the videos on repeat. So you, you already have that knowledge. Let's look at another scripture and we'll get back to the one in James. Let's take it to uh, 
Well, we know this one here, Revelation 3.16. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee. That's spit out. I will spit thee out of my mouth. God has no tolerance for the lukewarm so-called Christian. The straddling the fence, the one who's neither hot nor cold who's a mouth professor and, you know, says, oh, I believe in Jesus, I love God, and he loves me. Yet they're still living in a lifestyle of sin. The lukewarm are going to be spit out. And the scripture that I wanted to take you to is Proverbs 29.1. Uh, concerning those who are sinning, those who are uh, sinning when they know to do right and they're not doing it, as you stated you are doing, you've watched all the teachings on repeat. He that being often reproved, you said you sin, confess, sin, confess, you're on repeat. That means you've already been dealt with by the Spirit and, and, and told that you are doing something that's wrong and grievous towards God. You've been rebuked. He being often reproved, and that's your situation, hardeneth his neck. There it is. You begin to lose that sensation of conviction. Shall suddenly be destroyed and without remedy. Notice that. Suddenly, the cutting off, the judgment of God, the destruction, it'll come suddenly. You'll suddenly be destroyed. This isn't a type of a, a correction any, any longer. This isn't a little chastisement. This isn't just some sort of little punishment to where you're just going to learn your lesson and, and get back on course. No, you've been, you've been through that already here, through being often reproved. God has dealt with you softly in terms of chastisement to get you on the right track. And you know that. But you've grieved the Spirit of God and you've done despite unto the Spirit. The Bible says if you continue to sin willfully, there no longer, no longer remains any sacrifice for your sins. You're without remedy. And I've seen this happen to individuals in the past. Some pastors try to justify and say well he was he was you know it was just his time wait wait he died early he died before his time he was in willful sin he was engaged in, in in a lifestyle of abomination or he was under adultery or he was committing adultery he was in an adulterous relationship he never repented of his adultery or he was he was under the influence of drugs he was hanging out with the wrong wrong crowd how do you say that his death was just God's timing that he brought him home early to be with the Lord. Pastors will try to justify this type of destruction that comes upon the wicked. They'll justify it. Now, whether they know or they don't know, I don't know. But many of them like to justify it to not bring fear upon the congregation. And it's all about money. The love of money is the root of all evil. they rather just soften the blow and not tell the congregation the real reason why this so-called saint so-called saint was destroyed fell under destruction they'll justify it and they'll lie but the point is here it's in the word of god they were often reproved they hardened their neck and they were destroyed without remedy that was that was it so when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death without remedy. The sin unto death. Sin, when it is finished, it wasn't stopped. It wasn't stopped in its, in its path towards death through repentance, true repentance. That's the only way you can get the sin to stop its progression unto death, the sin unto death. It begins with the enticement, a uh, person's own cravings, curiosity, imaginations are running wild. And they get into the stage of lust and that conceives and it brings forth sin and that's not dealt with. And sin, when it's finished, it's bringing forth death. So as I stated, you say, you know your sin is grievous to God and it makes you feel awful. Oh, really? If it makes you really feel awful, then you'll do something about it and you'll truly repent. And it makes me feel 
awful and a little hopeless. Well, this hopeless feeling is despair, and that's that area of without remedy. Without remedy. This is hell, a portion of hell. This is a percentage. This is what I'm trying to get across to you people that when you cross over to the other side outside of God's presence and you're sent forth into that realm, that abode of death, uh, there is a strong, hopeless feeling that just saturates the soul and every fiber and muscle and bone of your being. From head to foot, everything in you feels hopeless. Like a dead piece of wood, there's no hope. You're lifeless. But you have knowledge of this when you cross over into the darkness. Now you're getting a little sense of that right now. You feel awful. You feel grieved. You know you're uh, violating God's law and his will. So this is, this is the thought process or the mindset or what's on the conscience. But when you cross over to the realm of the dead, when you're being banished into hell, these are the feelings you feel. An awful feeling that you've grieved God and you feel hopeless. You're in a very dangerous situation, my friend very dangerous situation and it's one thing to be a sinner cold sinner you have no knowledge of sin you're sinning you have no knowledge of god that's why god said i wish you were hot or cold if you're cold if you're outside of god's will out of his plan out of repentance you don't have a knowledge there's hope for you if you're hot you're on fire for god you're doing his will there's hope for you because you have the correction of the father you have the mercy and the grace of the father but when you're in that middle stage of lukewarmness when you're neither hot nor cold you're despised by God and the Bible says God will cut the hypocrite asunder cut him asunder cut him in half and then banish him into utter darkness into hell that's a, a destructive type of death spiritually speaking to be chopped up in pieces and discard it that's what God thinks of you when you're a lukewarm Christian there is no woe is me pity me in the kingdom of God we come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy we plead and we confess to God our sin and we hate our sin we hate our faults when we make when we make errors and when we sin against those we love or 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 people in the public or what whatever we abhor ourselves. We are angry with ourselves. We hate ourselves in a sense. And you do things about it and you get away from those temptations and you steer clear of them. When they come, you turn the other way. You understand the device. You're not easily tripped up anymore. You cast those imaginations down. You put yourself in check. And if you hunger after righteousness, you will be filled. If you hunger after righteousness, you shall be filled. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. That was one of my favorite scriptures when I first came to the Lord years ago. Because I knew that this body, this flesh, has a capacity and a desire to sin. That's what I found myself in when I was young. I had a strong desire to sin. And I knew that was going to be a type of obstacle in my relationship with God. So I quickly fell in love with that scripture. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Notice this in Psalm 15 as we close. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh truth in his heart. You see there, friend, this is something that you need to meditate on. Who's going to dwell in God's holy hill? They that walk uprightly, they work righteousness, they're not practicing sin, and they speak the truth in their heart. You're not speaking the truth in your heart. When you use language that is incorrect, that places you as the victim. 
You need to speak the truth in your heart. Do not try to deceive me, deceive anyone else, deceive yourself in using language that puts you in a mode of pity. Speak the truth in your heart. I've sinned. I've done wrong. I know what I did wrong was wrong, and it's no one's fault but my own. I need to put a stop to this. So I pray that in the end that you will come to this understanding, uh, such as the understanding I came to. Right now, if I go back into sin, knowing what I know, it's no one's fault. It's not God's fault. It's not my family's fault. It's not my neighbor's fault. It's not my friend's fault. It's not your fault. It's not anyone's fault but my own. I allowed certain things to progress and they led unto death, the sin unto death. It's no one's fault but my own. That is a mentality in the heart that we got to have that we need to take responsibility. But it's by the grace of God that I'm here, that I'm being sustained, that I rely upon his mercy and his help and his knowledge and his wisdom and his guidance. And did I say mercy? His mercy constantly depending upon his mercy being honest with myself and with others speaking truth in my heart not trying to uh, wipe it uh, or how they say uh, sweep it under the rug you're not going to get far with that sort of mentality you speak the truth in your heart you walk uprightly you will dwell in God's holy hill praise the Lord Hope this little message here was a blessing to you and maybe an eye-opener. Until next time, go in peace if there may be peace for you. In Jesus' name.